Okay, it's almost 12.30. Remember to type in your name in the chat box and say that you're here if you haven't done so already. And are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions about anything that we've covered so far or uh, any information about the class that you need? Okay. I don't know if you all realize it or not, but we will not be here next Tuesday. Monday and Tuesday next week, the school is closed down and the majority of classes are not being taught. You need to contact your professors, but most classes are not going to occur this coming Monday and Tuesday. It is a teacher's training day, those two days. So we will meet again next Thursday rather than on Tuesday coming up. So if there are no questions, then I am going to share our presentation on sensation and perception. So this unit, we've already talked a lot about sensation, we've talked about perception, and now we're going to actually go into depth. Sensation and perception occur Sensation on the nerves of the eyes, the nose, the ears, the mouth, the skin, and perception in the brain. So the brain senses the world indirectly because the sense organs convert stimulation into the language of the nervous system, which is electrical and chemical impulses. The brain does not see, the brain does not smell, the brain does not taste or touch or hear. The brain gets electrical signals from those organs which can see and smell and taste and touch and hear. So the interpretation of those electrical impulses can be very different from one person to another because electrical impulses themselves can be very different from one person to another. How, how many neurons do we have? in a specific area of our brain, how much chemical is being released by each one of the neurons, how fast they're performing, how many GABAs we have, how many glutamines we have. There's a whole host of differences in each person's brain. Since we're so different, because there is, as I've said, a spectrum of how we exist in the world as human beings, are you certain that the wavelength you see as blue is what another person sees as blue? Certainly this blue is what you have been told all your life is blue. But you, I don't know what you see. I don't know what color you see. I don't know how your brain interprets what you're seeing. Because the eyes see it and then send signals to the brain and the brain has to interpret it. So whatever you see, that's what you've always been told is blue. And it may not be what I see as blue. Maybe we all have the same favorite color, but we're all seeing something different. So that, I just want to blow your minds right at the beginning of this one. So some psychologists describe sensation as the initial stimulation of the brain. I don't think that that's correct. I think what other psychologists describe as sensation is the activation of the sense organs. We activate our sense organs, that is sensation. It sends the information then to the brain, which perceives the information at the brain level. Sensation then is the stimulation of sensory receptors. We have eyes that receive information from wavelengths of light, a very narrow bandwidth of wavelengths that are out there in the world. We have ears that hear certain frequencies in the environment, vibrations that are in the environment. We taste chemicals, we smell chemicals, we touch, we have nerve endings on our skin that respond to touch. So that sensation, when those particular neurons are activated, when those receptors are activated, then when they are activated, they transduce that information or convert that information into the 
chemical and electrical signals of the neurons and send that information to the central nervous system. Perception then is the active process that occurs in the brain and makes sense of the patterns of electrical activity that are coming to it. Sensations are organized in an inner representation of our world, in our memories, in specific ways, using past experience as a guide. So perception is subjective. We see the world differently than another person sees it because we have not had the same experiences as another person. I've already talked about in our city, Elizabeth City, there are fairly long blocks. And if you want to walk all the way around the block to get to the other side, you can. But there are alleyways that you can cut through. And at night, they're not lit. So you could run through the black, the dark alleyway, get to the other side, which I do on occasion. I just walk through and get to the other side. But if you have stepped on a piece of broken glass, a bottle in an alleyway, and slid open your foot, that alleyway doesn't have the same perception as it does for me. It's the same sensation. It's a dark alleyway. But because of your memories of having slit your foot open, you are a very different view of that alleyway than I would. Or if you have been accosted in a dark alleyway, then you have a very different perception of that dark alleyway, which is the sensations that we have. Of, that's, it's just a dark alleyway. But the way I see it, the way you see it, and the way somebody else sees it could be very, very different depending on how our experiences have affected us. So perception brings meaning to the sensations. So perception produces a subjective interpretation of our external world, not a perfect representation of it. And we talked about that in the memory chapter. Receptors are those specialized neurons that are activated by stimulation and transduce or convert that energy into a nerve impulse to send to the brain. So that's the receptors. Our eyes have rods and cones in them that are the receptors. Our ears have little hairs in them that are the receptors. We'll talk about every one of these things as we go through this unit. So sensory adaptation is when we become accustomed to a stimulus and less sensitive to it. You're sitting on your bums right now and you don't even feel it. You don't even notice that they're there because that particular sensation just sort of, you become adapted to it. You become habituated to it. That's what sensory adaptation is. So you might not notice the sound of an air handler in your room or the fan, if you have a fan that's going in the room. When you come in, you notice it, but then you sit down and, then, and you basically become adapted to that particular sound and you don't pay attention to it anymore. Unless, of course, somebody brings it to your attention. And this is advantageous because we have too much coming into our brains already into the sense memory areas and we can't pay attention to all of it. So it's a good idea to become adapted to certain, certain sounds and smells and sights as long as they stay the same because things that remain the same are probably not dangerous to us. But if you're out in the woods and the air is blowing fairly well, the wind's blowing and the leaves are making the rustling noise of leaves in the trees, you eventually begin to adapt to that and you don't pay attention to it anymore. You habituate to that particular sound. So you don't pay attention to it. But the snapping of a twig, now that you better pay attention to because it could be a bear walking through the forest. So anything that changes in our environment might be dangerous to, it, to us, but the things that stay the same are most likely not dangerous to us. So we're built to pay attention to those things that change. Absolute threshold is the minimal amount of energy that can produce a sensation at least half of the time. So if you are on a road and you can see 10 miles into the, down the road, and it's a dark, dark night, no, no moon, no stars, and there's a person 10 miles away down the road with a candle, and they're holding the candle, and they have their hand in front of it so the, the light doesn't come to you. They take their hand away, and they put their hand back again, take their hand away, put their hand back again. 
and they do it, say, 30 times. If it's the absolute threshold, 10 miles away for a candlelight, then you will see it out of the 30 times, you will see it 15 of those times, and 15 of the times you won't recognize that they took their hand away. You won't see the light. So that's the minimal amount of energy that can produce a sensation at least half of the time. The difference threshold is the smallest amount by which any stimulus can be changed and the difference be detected. If you walk into a department store and there's only one light on, when they turn on another light, just one other light, that's 50% of the light that was there before. So you recognize that immediately. But if all the lights are on except for one, and that one light gets turned on, you don't even notice it. You don't notice it. And this is described by Weber's law. The size of the just noticeable difference, or difference threshold, is proportional to the intensity of the stimulus and relationship to all other environmental stimuli. So, so I've already given you the department store one, but how about this one? When a baby gains one pound, you recognize it right away because that one pound is like one seventh of its weight. It's a, it's a big deal. But if a sumo wrestler <laughs> gains a pound, you have no idea that they gained a pound because it's one three hundredth of their current size. So this is Weber's law. The just noticeable difference is proportional to the intensity of the stimulus. In signal detection theory, the perceptual judgment is a combination of sensation and decision-making processes. A stimulus event occurs, a, a car backfires. You have neural activity because of that car backfiring, and now you have to compare it to all the information that you have in your brain. And was that necessarily a dangerous sound, or was it a sound that is okay to not pay attention to, and you decide to take action or not to take action? And usually a loud noise leads to a reflex action called the fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. Uh, but even in that case, as you are ready to fight, flight, run, or freeze, you are also figuring out what was that noise in your brain and determining whether it is the correct procedure to run or to fight or to freeze. All of our senses operate in basically the same way. They take information out of the environment and send that information to the brain, but each extracts different information and sends it to its own very specialized processing region of the brain. The eyes send information to the occipital lobe. The ears send it to the temporal lobe. The skin sends it to the, to the somatosensory perception in the parietal lobe. So we all all of our senses send information to their particular area of the brain. But that doesn't mean that they don't also interact with other parts of the brain as they're doing so. Your eyes, the, the uh, neuron that goes from your eyes back to the occipital lobe, also sends out axons all over the brain as that particular information is being sent back to the back. So we might actually be have an emotional reaction to something we see before it gets to the occipital lobe, before we even know what it is that we're seeing, we could have a uh, limbic system reaction to it because of the information that's being fed to the limbic system as the information's also being sent back to the occipital lobe. So that's pretty cool. How many senses do we have? How many senses do we have? Catherine says five. Kelly says five. Everybody's saying five, and that's what we're taught, is the five senses. But that's the five basic senses. We also have a sixth sense, and it is not the idea of being able to read people's minds or move objects. Or Our abilities extend beyond the five senses. And one of the major senses that we have that nobody seems to talk about is something called proprioception. I know exactly where my hands are in space without having to see them. I know where they are. They're in my lap or they're on the table. I, I control them. I keep them where they are because I know where they are. If I did not know where they were, if I did not get any of the information from the proprioceptors that are in all of our muscles going back to the brain, 
then I wouldn't know what it was and my arms would be moving around all over the place because I, I have no control over them. I have no idea where they are unless I look at them. Then I know where they are and I can hold them steady. But if I'm not seeing my hands, they're all over the place without proprioception. So the ability to know where your body is in space is called proprioception. It's not extrasensory perception. And it is, um, it's an interesting aspect of our senses. And there are people whose proprioceptors are not working properly. And there is a neuroscientist, neurologist, who wrote a book. His name was Oliver Sacks. And he wrote a book called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And over the many, many years of when he was a neurologist and working with patients, he took the, the best stories of his patients and what happened to them and their behaviors based on damage to their brain. It's an excellent book to read. It is a fun book to read even though it has some medical terminology in it, you could just skip the medical terminology because the stories are just fascinating of here's what this person's brain problem is and this is how it manifests itself in the real world. And it's called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat because there was a man who was unable to tell what he was looking at. His association cortex was not working. We'll talk about association cortex in just a minute. So the association cortex, that means you can't associate what you're looking at with any memory that you have. And he sat down and he took his hat off and he put it next to him and his wife was sitting on the other side of him. And when it was time to go, he reached over and tried to pick his wife up and put her on his head because he couldn't tell the difference between his wife and a hat because his association cortex was broken. It's a great book, Oliver Sacks. He just passed away recently. Johnny Ray shows us the beginnings of what we could be called as the Borg, if you are a Star Trek fan. We enhance our eyes with eyeglasses when we can't see well. We enhance our ears with hearing aids when we can't hear well. And it is interesting that we might be able to eventually put material into our brain to be able to do things with our brain that we can't even imagine today. Johnny Ray was the first. He was a 53-year-old paralyzed stroke victim. His, his, his spinal cord was broken, so all the signals from his brain were just disappearing. They couldn't get to his body. He could not speak from his, from his cheeks down. He was, he was paralyzed. And his parasympathetic nervous system was working. He, he still had his heartbeat was going. He was still breathing. And his brain was in it was perfectly normal brain. It just couldn't send any signals past the break in his spinal cord. So doctors took him to the hospital in Decatur, uh, Georgia. I, I lived right near Decatur, Georgia for a little while and visited the Veterans Hospital. But this man's brain had his motor cortex still working. He could think about moving his arm and move and moving his fingers. He can think about it, but that signal goes down to where the break was and wouldn't go any further. So he can still imagine doing working his body, but then none of those signals were getting out of his brain. So they took wires and hooked the wires up to his motor cortex and now connected those wires to a computer and when he thought about moving his hand, the mouse on the computer moved. So he could move a mouse and then click the mouse with his thoughts. So they were just extending that information from his motor cortex to a computer. <clears throat> Excuse me. And today they're able to take some of that and actually move it down into the body and repair the body's movement through uh, technological interaction instead of through the nerves that are broken, they'll put in wires and let the wires reconnect. So we have all kinds of ways today that we do this and there are Bluetooth devices now where they don't have wires coming out of their head. They now have a Bluetooth device inserted 
and they can connect to a computer through Bluetooth and make the computer walk, talk for them, select what they want for dinner or lunch. Remember, he can't talk. The only thing he could do is blink his eyes. So he could say yes or no using his eyes, but that was it. Now, if he'd known Morse code, maybe he could have done, you know, his left eye for dots and his right eye for dashes. And you, but then the doctors and nurses would have had to know how to read Morse code too. So, but he was able to reconnect with his world through this device. Does that sound cool? I'm seeing yeses. And today they just they're they're going way beyond what they did. Now the one of the doctors who lost his funding decided that he would actually work on it himself. He he went to another country and had the uh, devices that he created put into his own brain. And that's a story in itself because uh, he couldn't do it in the United States. It's illegal. He didn't have funding to do it. And you can't, you don't experiment on yourself. But he lost his ability to speak for a long time after that. And then he, he got it back again. And it's just, it's a really cool story about how he connected himself to computers using his own devices that he created. So let's start with vision and talk about vision. Here are some of the terms that we need to know. Hue, H-U-E, hue, is the color of light that is determined by its wavelength. As I said, the wavelength is, we, we all say one wavelength is blue, but how do we know what we're actually seeing? So red is the end, as one end of the spectrum, and violet is the other end of the spectrum that we can see from red to violet. But red going in the in toward the red direction, there's infrared and we can't see infrared, but it's out there. And for violet, there's ultraviolet, but we can't see it. It's outside of our ability to respond. Our eyes only respond to a very, very narrow wavelength of information. But wavelength is just wavelength, just waves. Light is waves. Radiation is waves. Radio waves, television waves, they're all out there. And our eyes, and we don't have any senses that actually sense those things, so they're invisible to us. The cornea is the transparent part of the eye. The iris is the muscle of the eye. And the pupil is the opening in the eye. The lens is a piece of skin. And it is behind the pupil. And there are muscles attached to it. And the muscles stretch that piece of skin or relax that piece of skin, allowing us to focus on specific things far away or close up. But it's a piece of skin. And skin gets old. And by the time you're 40 years old, that piece of skin is very difficult to move. You can't stretch it like you could before or relax it like you could before. And depending on whether it ends up being stretched and solid or, or relaxed and solid, you can't move it anymore, you have either near vision or far vision. And of course, I have three lenses on my glasses. I can't see far or near. But because it's a piece of skin, it also, as it gets older, gets opaque. You can't see through it anymore. It starts to turn darker, and that is called cataracts. And now they can take the lens out of your eye and put in a replacement. And in the past, they would put glass in your eye. They'd, put a, they'd take a piece of glass and stick the piece of glass in your eye to replace the lens. And that piece of glass was specifically designed for a long distance or a short distance, and you had to wear glasses for the other side. Today, they put in plastic as a lens. You can see through plastic. But they're at the point where they're developing a see-through rubber that is stretchable. And so they can reconnect the muscles to this new type of lens, and supposedly you will be able to learn again to see and focus long distance or short distance, and you won't need glasses anymore for either one of them. 
Now I'm just, I'm 63 years old and I'm just starting to have trouble now with my cataracts. So I'm hoping that they will have developed this product really well before I have to have the cataract surgery and get lens replacement because I would love to have that and never have my glasses again. That would be terrific. You can't just have your lens replaced at 40. That this, the insurance companies won't replace your lens. You can go get glasses. They'll pay for glasses, but they won't, have your, they won't pay for the lens replacement. When you can't see through your lens anymore because of cataracts, then the insurance company will pay for a new lens and hopefully this new version of a lens when it finally comes out. The retina is the area of the inner surface containing rods and cones. The rods and cones react to light. So the retina is that area in the back that has rods and cones on it. But there's a piece, a place in the retina that has no rods and cones because the optic nerve goes out of the eye in that particular area. There's no rods and cones in that area. It's a blind spot. It's a dead spot. You can't see in that area. But the left eye can see what the right eye can't see, and the right eye can see what the left eye can't see. So the brain fills it all in, and you don't see that there are blind spots. In fact, they're horrible. Our, our sight is actually terrible because we have all kinds of floaters in our eyes, and we have blood vessels that are going through and obscuring our vision in certain areas. So we don't see very well, but our brain makes a nice, smooth, beautiful view of the world for us. So these photoreceptors are the rods and cones, and they respond to light. The ganglion cells that come from the rods and cones form the optic nerve. The optic nerve is the nerve that transmits optical sensory information to the brain, to the back of the brain, the occipital lobe. The fovea is, there's a dead spot where you can't see anything because there are no rods or cones in that area, but the fovea is a place where there's a great deal of cones, the largest percentage of cones in this particular area of your eye. It's not all over the eye e equally. There's one spot in your eye where it's much better. And it's not in the center. <laughs> it's off to the side. In both eyes, it's off to the side. Have you all ever heard of the Seven Sisters, the stars called the Seven Sisters? There's a Greek tragedy about the Seven Sisters ending up as stars in the sky. Anybody heard of them? Oh, there, there are, some of you have. Most of you haven't. Well, the story really isn't important. What's important is that there are these seven stars in the sky that are right together, and five of them are really easy to see. The sixth one sort of blinks in and out depending on what's in the atmosphere at the time, and the seventh one is, very, is almost impossible to see if you're looking directly at them. If you look just to the right or just to the left of the seven sisters, that seventh star comes right into view, right into focus. You can see that star. The light of that star is now hitting the fovea of your eye, which means you have more cones that are getting activated, and now you can see you're getting enough of an electrical signal to your brain that says, oh, there's a star up there. Pigeons have two foveas per eye. They see much better than we do. I already talked about the blind spot where the axons form the optic nerve and leave the eye. There are 120 million rods in the eye and they respond to intensity of light. And there are five million cones which respond to wavelength of light for color. The mixture of light is an additive process and the mixture of pigment is a subtractive process. Now what do I mean by that? If I take red light, green light, blue light, and yellow light and put them all together, what color light do I get? If it is an additive process, what color light do I get? Adding red, green, blue, and yellow light together, what do I get? Nobody has a clue? 
Oh, orange is a good, I like that. I forgot orange. I could add orange to it too. Brown. Have any of you ever used a prism? Thank you, Lauren. White light. Take a prism, shine white light into it, and it breaks it into a rainbow. Because white light is made from all of those colors. And the prism breaks down those colors and changes the pattern of the way that the, the light is reflected, and so it breaks them up apart. So all light coming together creates white light. And that's why it's called an additive process. It is white instead of dark. You can't see anything. Pigment is a completely different type of structure. When you take blue and, and color paint blue on something, the paint is absorbing, subtracting all of the colors except for blue. Blue is being reflected, and that's why we see the blue, because all the other colors are being subtracted or, or being absorbed by that particular paint. If you take blue paint, green paint, and red paint, and all the other colors of paint, so that it absorbs everything, the only color you get back is black. No color. And that's why it's called a subtractive process. So that's the difference between light and pigment. So the electromagnetic spectrum is the entire range of electromagnetic energy, including radio waves, x-rays, television waves, microwaves, and this little tiny little space called visible light. The visible spectrum is a tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum to which our eyes are sensitive because the cones and the rods respond to those particular wavelengths. We don't have any that respond to anything outside of the ultraviolet area or the infrared area. But bees, bumblebees, see ultraviolet. They see colors that we don't see. They see wavelengths that we don't see. Why? Why would they have any need to see anything like that? It turns out. Flowers with pollen have a visible, to the bee, ultraviolet flare-up. So they are attracted to the flowers that have the pollen because they are showing ultraviolet waves. And they're attracted to those ultraviolet waves. But we can't see those. We just see the visible light that the, that the particular flower is producing. How many of you have walked somewhere and you tripped on nothing? It was just like, what? I just tripped over my own feet. There's nothing there. I just tripped for no reason. What if it's like there are animals that are walking around the earth that only reflect ultraviolet? We would not be able to see them. There's nothing like that. <laughs> we know there's nothing like that because we can make devices that see and respond to ultraviolet and all the other kinds of, of wavelengths that are out there. So there is no such thing as little creatures running around that you trip over that you can't see. Also, women tend to be able to see wavelengths that men cannot see. So there is something on the X chromosome that helps women to see specific colors that men just don't see. Now there's very few women like this, this is a spectrum again, remember, but there are those women whose genes just came together right, and they can stand outside of a garden, and they can, and they can point to each one of the tomatoes that is ready to be picked or it's gonna go bad, because they're showing a different color, but all I see is, orange and red, that's all I see, in, and, but the red ones are ready to be picked, right? Not necessarily, but they're also not going to go bad tomorrow, but these women are so good, they can actually tell you which ones will be rotten tomorrow if you don't pick them today. And only women have this ability, men don't have it. 
So brightness is the sensation caused by the intensity of light waves. Intensity is the amplitude of a particular thing, and you're looking at, and when you're in a department store and all the lights are on, it's very bright, and when half the lights are on, Walmart likes to do this for some reason. They turn half their lights off, then turn half the lights on, and I don't, I guess maybe they're trying to save the bulbs, but uh, the, you can see the difference in the intensity as, the, as they change the a number of light bulbs that are on. And they stimulate the rods, and that is what we determine as brightness, as we see as brightness. Color blindness is not being able to see specific colors. Now, I put down here a picture of a circle that has red or brown and green in that picture. If you cannot see the red and the green, you might want to talk to somebody, but also realize that this particular picture is a copy of a copy of a copy, and so it's not really the best example, but you should be able to see that there are at least brown and red and green. Right? So some people see the red as brown, some people see it as red, but there's definitely a green also, a different color. Can everybody see the other color? Is there anybody that can't see the other color? So all of you are able to, to view this particular thing. There's a number in it. Yes, there is. The question is, can you tell the color? Can you tell from the colors what number it is? There's a 1, and it's either a 15 or a 17 or maybe a 13. I can't really tell the, what I see, uh, but at least I know I've seen two different colors. Uh, most of you are saying 17. So, of course, if you have any kind of question, you need to see uh, a an ophthalmologist so that they can test your vision if you have a question about it. Are any of you, do you, any of you know that you are colorblind? Nobody's saying yes to that. So colorblindness is not unusual. Uh, it is in the normal distribution curve, abnormal. The majority of us can see all colors. I have problems with blue. I can see blue, but there are certain colors of blue that are very difficult for me. It's really interesting. The blue that's on airport runways tends to be just, just inside my ability to see that color. It's really an interesting color because I, I can see that it's there, sort of. It's there, but it's a, I love the color. because I don't know if it's blue or purple, but it's a really interesting color that they use on the runways. So color blindness is a vision disorder that prevents an individual from discriminating certain colors, and the majority of colorblind people are red-green colorblind. They cannot see the difference between red and green, and that's why I picked this particular picture to show you, because most all of you could see the two different colors in there. But the interesting thing about, uh, about colorblindness, red-green colorblindness, is the majority of red-green colorblindness is caused by red cones. The red cones are too active, and they stay active all the time. If the red and green are supposed to be normally the same amount level of energy, but in people with red-green colorblindness, the red is way more active, and so the green is suppressed mostly, and you can't see the difference between those colors. And we can give them glasses that block out all the red light, and then the, there's not any red coming to these particular these cones, and so the amount of their activity decreases, and then all of a sudden, boom, they can see colors. And you can go to Facebook and look up these. They're like $300 for a pair. I want to buy one just to have for my students that are colorblind so they can see what, what it's like. But this is, an, you'll see people crying because all of a sudden they're seeing colors they've never seen before. The interesting thing is I wonder if they're seeing the same colors that we're seeing <laughs> with red taken out of the spectrum, basically. So if you can't see the number inside the circle, don't worry. The slide is not a great example of the colors. So if you want to know for sure, go to a vision expert. In any case, some people's cones do not respond properly to wavelengths. And, it, and if you can see all the colors, then you are called trichromatic because it's red, blue, and green are the actual colors that we see, red, blue, and green, and then we have a combination of red, blue, and green that cause us to see all the other co colors. 
There are people who cannot see any color at all. There was an artist, not very famous artist. He was, he, he drew in colors. And then he lost, he lost his ability to see color. He only sees black, white, and grays. That's all he sees. And so his, his pictures, his, his paintings are now black, white, and grays. And he's become famous because of that. But there are people who just don't see any color at all. Uh, photoreceptors are light sensitive cells in the retina that lights energy to neural impulses. We just talked about that. Rods and cones are the two different types. The trichromatic theory of vision says that we have different cones that react to different wavelengths of light and combine to give us our colors. That's red, blue, and green. And the fovea, as I said, is the area of sharpest vision in the retina, and pigeons have two per eye that can actually see better than we can see. The optic nerve comes out of the eye at a blind spot in the eye, and each eye's blind spot is in a different region of the space so that what the left eye can't see, the right eye can, and what the right eye can't see, the left eye can, and the brain just fills in the information so we see a very smooth picture of the world. The primary visual cortex is in the back of the brain. It is the occipital lobe. It takes up 25% of the brain, and it is the majority of it is specifically for sight. It is the largest part of the brain dedicated to one of our senses. There are specialized cells in the occipital lobe that respond to very specific types of information out in the world. So if I draw a line on the page, your brain reacts to that line in a very specific way. There are certain neurons that will fire off. All the rest of the neurons in the occipital lobe are quiet. But these are firing off. And the same thing is true of this one, this line. And if I, this line, and this line, and this line, and this line, all these lines there are certain neurons in your, in your occipital lobe that fire off when your eyes send the signal of that particular field of vision. Maybe that's the way we actually recognize people because every person has different structures in their face. Their nose is different. Their chin's different. There are some people oval faces, some people round faces. So maybe it's this group of neurons are firing off that we connects to this person and this name and all the information and memories we have of that person. And that's part of what's called the association cortex. The association cortex, although all these specialized cells are responding, without the association cortex, we would not know what all those cells responding meant. So I can look out in my room and I can see all these parallel lines on the wall. There's four parallel lines, two of them parallel down, another parallel this way. My brain says that's a door. I have an association cortex that takes that information and says that's a door, not a window. And there are people whose association cortex is not working. They cannot associate the man who mistook his wife for a hat. They cannot associate what they see with anything that they know, their memories. They can't connect them together. Uh, there are people that have what's called facial aphasia also. There's a specific area of the brain that, that lights up when you see somebody's face that you recognize. And some people have facial aphasia. That part of the brain does not work. So they can never recognize somebody by their face. I'm just the opposite. I can see somebody's face and I know I've seen that face before. I recognize that face. And I can recognize people and go, oh my gosh, that person looks like this person because they're so close and similar together. But the names, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> forget about it. I can't get names. Names just don't come to me. I can't get the connection. I know the person. I know all about them. All the memories about them that themselves what I know associated with all of my experiences with that person, but their name just, it takes a long time for me to remember names. Do you all have problems with names? All 
Are you all still there? Okay. So the association cortex is very important and the association cortex for the, for the, for the eyes, the association cortex for the ears are different. The association cortex for nose, for, for touch, for taste, all those association cortexes are different in different places in the brain. After images are the images that come to us uh, because we had something flashed into our eyes. Have you ever had a, a bright light flashed into your eyes and all of a sudden you're seeing spots? The spots are actually dark because after image is the opposite of what was flashed into your eyes. So if you had the light flashed into your eyes, the bright light, whatever bright light plate, it was a, maybe a flashlight with three little bulbs in it, then you see three little dark spots in your veil of vision for a little while because that's called an after image. The sensations that linger after the stimulus is removed. And it's the opposite color or the opposite intensity. Bright light creates lack of light, and blue creates le a yellow, and red creates green, and green creates red, and yellow creates blue. So those are the opposite complementary. The neural rebound effect explains the after images along with the opponent process theory. We say, here's our normal level of vision when we're not looking at anything particular. And all of a sudden we see something red and the red gets, ooh, red is activated. I can see red. But not only is red activated, green is removed, is actually suppressed. When red goes away, it, the red comes back down and the green comes back up. But the green does not come back up all with just stopping right there. It continues higher and then comes back down again to where it belongs. When it comes back up, when it goes up, you see green. Your brain is recognizing green in your environment even though it's not there. So when one color neuron is activated, the opposite neuron is suppressed, and when the suppression stops, an auto-rebound activation occurs. I'm going to show you a slide. I want you to look at the center dot in the slide. And then I'm going to click it, and it'll be a blank page, and you will see something completely different. Remember, green is the opposite of red, black is the opposite of white, and yellow is the opposite of blue. This is not a great picture, especially on some of your phones, but look at your phone. Look at that little dot in the center. Do not take your eyes off the dot. Do not blink. Do not move your eyes around. Just stare straight at that little dot until your eyes start to hurt because your eyes are starting to dry out. Don't blink. Don't blink. And now blink. Now you can blink. Did you see the, the American flag? Stare at that again. So stare at that little, little dot again. Stare right at that dot. Do not take your eyes off the dot. Keep your eyes on the dot. Keep your eyes open. Do not blink. And do not let your eyes wander around. It's going to hurt a little bit because your eyes are starting to dry out. And then now you can blink. Do you see the American flag? Did you see it? Did everybody see it? Okay, good. Here's another one for you. This one is not color. This one is black and white. Uh, look at the little dots in the center here of this uh, picture. Little three, there are four little dots there. Just stare right at the four little dots. Do not take your eyes off the little dots. Keep your eyes on the dots. Don't move your eyes around the page. Try really hard to stare straight at the dots until your eyes start to hurt because they're starting to dry out. And then who do you see? You can keep blinking. This one should last longer, actually, because black and white does last longer than the uh, colors do. But who did you see? We have a, a lot of, uh, in America, we tend to say that this was Jesus. Yeah? Did you see it? Okay. Here's another one, black and white again. Um, and you'll recognize this right away, even though we haven't seen the actual picture yet. But this, these are negatives. This is what a negative looked like when we did uh, print pictures with paper. We had negatives. This is what a negative is. 
So stare right at the little uh, plus sign, the red plus sign. Stare at the plus sign. Don't take your eyes off the plus sign. Keep staring right at the plus sign until your eyes start to hurt. Don't blink. Don't let your eyes wander around. And then, boom, who do we have? President Obama. Right? Is that cool? This is after images. This is what after images are. Now this one, this next one is a, <clears throat> is people say, tell me who it is, but I have no idea. You can make, tell me who it is, but um, stare at this picture. This is a real negative. This is, an, <laughs> this is what a negative really looked like. If you have pictures and you have the negatives, look at the negatives. Um, there are not very many left in the world. <laughs> Most people have gone to digital, but look at a negative and the negative looked just like this. This is what a negative looked like. Look at the little dot on her nose. Just keep staring at the dot on this lady's nose. Keep staring at the dot. Do not take your eyes off the dot. And then I will click. And does anybody recognize that person when they saw the actual image? Are you all tired today? You're not responding. Hello, are you out there? I'll do it again. Look straight at the little dot on her nose and the bridge of her nose. Keep looking at the dot. Don't let go of the dot. Don't blink. Don't move your eyes around. Just keep staring at the dot. And then all of a sudden, boom, you got <laughs> no, no clues. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Next, follow this little dot around and around and around and around and around. It's a pink little dot. And now, instead of going around and around and around, look at the center and just stare at the center for a little bit. And that little pink dot will turn green. Did it happen for you guys? Did you get the green dot? Now, because it's flashing, and it's not, it's not great because it's, it's flashing for some reason. i got to fix that. But if it wasn't flashing and you just kept staring at that, uh, that cross in the center, the dots disappear. They all just disappear, and the only one that, that's active is the green dot going around and around in a circle. You don't even see the others anymore, which is pretty cool. This one is a JPEG file. JPEGs do not move but it looks like there's a movement somewhere in it, and then you look to see where the movement is, but it's not moving anymore, and then somewhere else starts to move. This is a JPEG file, no movement, it's not like a GIF. Here's an illusion, uh, a visual distortion or a visual perception distortion. Let me take these steps and go down, okay? I'm gonna start from here. And I'm going to go down. So I go down one, two, down three, down four, down five, more down, 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 again, down, 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 down. And I ended up right back where I was, which is impossible because you can't just keep going down and end up at the same spot you were. There's something wrong. And artists love to do this. This is what artists do best. They understand the illusions and they can put them into your, their paintings and their drawings and make it look like, wait, there's, wait, there's something wrong here. The best I've ever seen is a painter called Escher. And this is Escher's waterfall. If I would love to have this house because if you have a wheel, a water wheel, you can create your own electricity. I would, I spend $300 a month on the electricity on this house. $300 a month for electricity. I could save if I had a water wheel like that and produce my own electricity. But no one has a water wheel like that because the water comes down and then goes up the channel, up the channel to come back down again. Water does not go against gravity. You cannot have this happen. This is impossible. <laughs> you get that? This is not possible. And if you look at this little pylon right here, there's obviously something wrong because this 
these two right here should not be one underneath the other. Also in this picture, and Escher is great for this, is like, wait, there's something wrong there. But then there's something wrong all over the picture. These particular plants are plants that live at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> so this whole place, the waterfall, everything is underwater. And this girl over here, this lady is, is hanging up her clothes, is hanging them up underwater. <laughs> yes, absolutely, Xander, absolutely your head starts to hurt when you're starting to try to figure out what's wrong with this picture. Imagine having drawn it. <laughs> this, class, this is an amb ambiguous picture. I happen to like margaritas, so I see a, the first thing I see is a margarita glass. That's the very first thing I see. But there's also two people looking at each other, their noses, their mouths, their chins, their foreheads, looking at each other. That's an ambiguous picture. And this is the most famous of all ambiguous pictures. Uh, and have you ever seen this picture before, any of you? Yes, Morgan has. No, Tiffany hasn't. I've seen more no's than yeses. So this particular picture is interesting because it has two different people in it. And if you are young, you see one picture. And if you are old, you see a different picture. Remember when I said in memory, we tend to, to focus on what's like us. And so if we are young, we focus on the young woman in this picture. And if we're old, we focus on the old person in this picture. So what do you see here? Is this a nose or is it a chin? Is it the young girl or the old woman? This yellow is the old woman. This is the, the whole yellow is the old woman's face. She has a huge nose. She has a very pointed chin, and her mouth is right there. Her mouth, her chin, her nose. This is an eye, the left eye for her. She looks a little depressed. She's looking down. She's in a fur coat. Can you see the old woman? It's hard for young people to see the old woman because they're focused on the young woman. This is the young woman's face. She's looking off to her right. She's looking off to her right. And you see her, her eyelashes. You can't see her eyes. And you see her chin, left side of her face. And you see her left ear. And she's dead because somebody slit her throat. <laughs> no, she's wearing a necklace of some kind, right? Do you see that? Do you see the young woman? And who did you see first, the young one or the old one? Who did you see first, the young one or the old one? Young, 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 young. Young, then old. Okay, I was able to show you the old and you were able to see it. It's still difficult to see it if you if the, see the young one first. So I'm, I'm very happy all of you are young people, young-minded people, because you did not see the old person first. I see the old person first. <laughs> I'm going to set you up here for um, a picture. All right, we all know these are mallard ducks. Well, you know they're ducks. You might not know they're mallards. This is a male mallard, female mallard. All right, so this is the female mallard duck looking off to the left. This is a pelican looking off to the left. This is a sandpiper looking off to the left. All these are typical, typical birds around our area. This is a seagull looking off to the left. This is a cute little duck looking off to the left. This is a duck I have no idea what it is, sort of looking off to the left. And this one, this little duckling is like running across the water screaming for its mom, mommy, 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 <laughs> off to the left. As is this duck screaming, mommy, 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 I want, it. want my mommy. Right? Or is it? Is it a duck? So what do you see in here? If I showed you a squirrel looking off to the right, and I showed you a raccoon looking off to the right, and Anaya has it, and if I show you a possum looking off to the right, and a rabbit looking off to the right, then here is a rabbit sitting on its butt looking off to the right. And these are its ears. Do you get that? Do you see 
that this is an ambiguous picture. It can be either one. Do you get that? What do you see? How many of you saw the bunny rabbit? How many have you see the duck? And how many of you see both? So lots of you are seeing both, and the duck and the bunny. You're, you're not seeing a duck or a bunny. I'm sorry, people. You're seeing gray picture, gray, black, and white picture drawn on a piece of paper. You're not seeing a duck or a rabbit. Your brain is creating all of that. All you're seeing is a picture of a gray thing with a black thing on it and uh, a whole bunch of white around it. You get that? You get that? You are making up a duck or a bunny out of this design. There are two different ways to approach certain problems in life, bottom-up pro processing and top-down processing. How many of you like uh, jigsaw puzzles? Uh, do any of you like jigsaw puzzles? Some of you do like jigsaw puzzles. If you don't like a jigsaw puzzle, say no. I don't see anybody that's saying, oh, there's one. I hate jigsaw puzzles. I absolutely despise them. But my little girl likes to play jigsaw puzzles, so I'll play with her sometimes with the jigsaw puzzles. But if I'm going to put together a jigsaw puzzle, I want to see the top of the box. Bottom-up processing is the analysis that emphasizes characteristics of the stimulus rather than the, the whole thing putting a jigsaw puzzle together without looking at the top of the box. I want to see the top of the box. I am a top-down processor. I am much more comfortable top-down processing. Of course I can take a jigsaw puzzle and I can put it together if I have to in bottom-up processing, but I way prefer top-down processing. We're emphasizing the perceiver's expectations and memories and other cognitive factors putting the puzzle together with the box top so that you know what it's like. My mom, my grandfather owned a business, Philadelphia, 4th Street, called The Exchange. And they would take in carburetors from all over the country and they would repair them and return them. And my mother grew up in that factory, learning how to pull a a carburetor apart and put it back together again. Now we don't use carburetors in cars anymore, but she could take an old carburetor and she could pull it apart. She puts me to shame. She watched it being done as a kid and she can do it really well. And I'm the same way. I know, I'm, I love working with my hands and I used to play in the exchange also. Uh, and I, I love working with my hands, but I want to see somebody do that particular task one time so that I can then copy it. I don't want to try to figure it out myself. And instructions are horrible. Why do men not pay attention to instructions? Because instructions are horrible. <laughs> I want to watch somebody who knows how to do it, do it, and then I can do it. I can copy it. That's top-down processing. I've already seen how it's done. Now I can copy it. And I'm much better at that than I am at bottom-up processing. But we can all do both. It's just we prefer one or the other. Just like right-brained and left brain, we can do both. So perceptual constancy is the ability to recognize the same object under different conditions, such as changes in illumination, distance, or location. We see the Eiffel Tower, and we know the Eiffel Tower isn't this big when we're in an airplane. We, and we can see all the little tiny ants walking around under it as the airplane goes over also, which are the people, right? But we know that shape does not change, size does not change, it's just the distance we have to that particular object. So size constancy, we tend to perceive objects as remaining the same size even though the impact on the visual field changes as the distance between us and it changes. I'm not getting bigger. I'm just getting closer and closer and closer to the camera. I am not changing my, I'm not going to blow up like a balloon. <laughs> so shape constancy also, we tend to perceive objects as remaining the same shape, even though the impact on the visual field changes as the angle between us changes. This box is really a cool one. Look right in the center of right, right here where the 
uh, arrow is, and this box will start changing shape for you. <laughs> for me, this box right here, this square is forward. And then all of a sudden, this square becomes high and forward. And every person has a different way that they see this box. But once it starts to switch, it's hard to keep it from switching. It just switches back and forth and back and forth. So stare at that middle section and see, and you'll see how it switches. You all see the switching? Catherine says yes. Tiffany Lawrence says yes. Great. Good. How can we trust our brain when our brain fools us so, so easily or is, or is fooled so easily? So here's the Herman grid, another thing where our brain doesn't see the world the way it really is. You should see that in the Herman grid a little gray spot in between all of the different square, black squares. But there is no spot there. Your brain is creating a spot that doesn't exist. And when you look at it, it disappears and the spots appear somewhere else instead. And this one is we have a learned preference to see the world a specific way. If you know English, then this group of characters means something to you. And you recognize that it can't be the exact same thing. This one three and this one three and this one three cannot be one three. It doesn't make any sense for that. This has to be a B to be home by four B. No, no, four thirteen. <laughs> and only if you understand English do you get to see this B because we know what B is and we know what by is and we know this sentence. We know it makes sense. The sentence makes sense. And for other people, they, they don't know what 1, 3, E means. Oh, oh, it's a B. Oh, B, E. Oh, because they don't know English. So perceptual set, our readiness to detect a particular stimulus in a given context, we can, and you may have seen these on Facebook where they, they send out a Facebook meme and everything in it is spelled incorrectly, but you can still read it. So we are prepared by our learning to be able to see things in a specific context. But Gestalt psychologists say, oh, there's a whole host of stuff that we have innate built into us. Gestalt psychology is the, main, is the view that much of perception is shaped by innate factors built into our brain. They say the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. A figure is the part of the pattern that commands our attention. So for instance, in The Farmer and His Wife, a famous painting where the farmer is holding on to a, to a, not a rake, not a sith. I can't remember what it is he's holding. You pay attention to the farmer and his wife and the, and the thing he's holding, but there's a whole background, the, the ground area. The figure is the part of the, of, the, of the painting that gets your attention. The man, his wife, and that thing, pitchfork, thank you very much, Sander, that he's holding, a pitchfork. And that grabs your attention. That's the figure, according to their definition. That's a term, the figure. The ground is the background images that you don't really pay attention to, and you probably would have a hard time telling me what they are, even though you've probably seen that picture a hundred times. And a five phenomenon is the ability of individual frames, pictures, placed together, running through them at 32 frames per second, or pictures per second, gives us the illusion of movement. So in a movie, in the days of celluloid, now it's all digital, but in the days of celluloid, we had a picture, another picture, taken right after another picture, taken right after another picture, and then we showed all these pictures in a row at 32 frames per second. And what we see in the movie theater is movement. The man's hands moving, his mouth moving, and, and the car is going by. We see movement, but all it really is is one picture after another picture after another picture. That's called the phi phenomenon. And if I take this particular dot right here next to phi phenomenon. We'll use that one. 
the phi phenomenon picture and we move it over to here. We just have it appear here and then disappear, appear back over here, disappear, appear back over here, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what you will eventually see is the movement going like this. Instead of back and forth and back and forth, you actually see it moving back and forth, which is a part of the phi phenomenon. Closure is seeing things and knowing to close off them, that we have four lines here, but we see a square. We see three lines, but we see a triangle. We see two lines, but we see a circle. So that's called closure. And this one is really interesting because this is a triangle, and this is the same triangle with some Pac-Man put on it. So you see the Pac-Man. But what the Pac-Man have done is they have created a whole other triangle that looks lighter than the page, but it's not. It's the exact same page. There's nothing there. There's nothing there but the Pac-Man. And then there's, you see this line that goes from the Pac-Man's mouth, but then from there all the way through, you see a line that doesn't exist. It's not there. How can we trust our vision when it is so easily mistaken? Do you get that? Do you see, do, does everybody see the Star of David? The six-sided star? Yeah. But there's really no star there. It's just three Pac-Men going to eat <laughs> the triangle. <laughs> that really isn't a full triangle either. It's just we're putting together the lines and closure and saying it's a triangle. Waka, waka, waka. Yes, that's right, Alexander. That's right. Uh, this is where I stopped in the last class, so I'm going to stop here also with this class. If you have, remember, we are not coming back on Tuesday. Monday and Tuesday, school is closed for students. It's a teacher training days, two, two teacher training days. So Monday and Tuesday, almost all classes are canceled next this coming week. So we won't meet on Tuesday. The next time we meet will be on Thursday, and we'll finish up this particular section. Are there any questions? Put them down. If you want to talk to me, I'll be here for a little while afterwards. And if not, then have a great week. I will see you in a week. A week, okay? <laughs> Stay healthy. Bye.